Welcome all to Making Sense Online. It is a, well, roughly twice a week, not even sure if it's a podcast with Dave Cormier just chatting about things and news and random stuff that happened on the internet over the last week slash whatever uh, strikes our fancy. How's your week been, Dave? Uh, it's been good. I'm going to go first this time because you always get the first link in and I just I slid in there. I've been having a great week. Uh, I think my brain is finally starting to wake up. I've had a ton of conversation the last couple of weeks with lots of people who, some of them quite prolific, who have been really struggling to get any work done outside of, oh my God, what are we doing? And so today and yesterday have been the first days I've actually been able to start working again. So I'm feeling quite good about it. And I thought I would start out with a really nice light Insight Higher Ed article from a couple days ago with some predictions, George. There've been lots of really interesting predictions about the internet and about what's gonna happen to higher ed in the next uh, in the next couple of years, right? And I just thought it might be fun to hear your thoughts, George, on Josh Kim's predictions about the future of higher ed. So there are three of them in here. One of them is that blended learning will dramatically increase. The next one is that online education will be a strategic priority at every institution. And the third one is that existing potential OPM partnerships will be rethought. What do you think of those, George? Well, Dave, I think it's rude, rude, I say, that you start off with softball questions. I think our prediction capability in the education space is really kind of not great. It's kind of like, this is the equivalent of most, and this is nothing against Joshua Kim, but this is how most of these predictions go. It's the equivalent of saying, if you don't die, you will live. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, so that's nice. Thank you for that. I don't, I appreciate the desire to see the future and to have a sense of where things are going to land. I'm not quite sure what the significant benefit of it is. So there's two things here unrelated to this article. One is that if we were able to predict the future, then what would we actually do with it that is novel and interesting? Because I just read an article this last week that looked at the slow roll of the COVID crisis and the fact that we knew what was coming. We knew early January, mid-January, what was going to happen in the U.S. So I think that's one dimension to think about is simply because we know the future doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to marshal any kind of significant resources. So I think that's one element that we really need to, to uh, do a better job of identifying is that we don't have the capability to marshal resources to respond to known things. That's a significant factor that I want to emphasize. So let's say that um, Josh is right on all of these. And these aren't complex predictions. Um, I think anybody would say, yes, we're gonna be online more. Yes, we're gonna be blended more. And people are already rethinking their OPM relationship and have been for a number of years. By the way, OPM, for those of you that are unaware, are these uh, program groups that come into universities. So the best way to look at it is if a university has failed to demonstrate leadership and advanced preparation for their institution, they have to buy that expertise. So a university that has a tight connection to an OPM is one that will have a history of failure with leadership. So yeah, that's just my good. very own assumption. And I would go further and say, buy it from people who claim to have that expertise. Yeah. So that's me saying, what would it matter? Point one, if we got those predictions right, we wouldn't be able to necessarily change things because these are systemic predictions. Give me predictions that are more relevant at a classroom level and that's useful. This is these kinds of predictions, even though they're not really predictions, they're sort of not even extrapolation of trends. They're statements of what's happening now. So they're a prediction for today. Like I predicted that I had a coffee this morning. That's my prediction. So that's the first point. We don't know what we would do with it even if we could. Second point is, um, you know, that flows out of it, which is there's a huge leadership gap here. There is... I shared this with a group last week, but we did a paper about four years ago, uh, or a larger-ish report, a couple hundred pages that looked at preparing for the digital university. Um, and that just looked at what's happening, what's coming. Everybody knew the digital university is coming. Everybody should have been preparing their institutions for them. Very few people did. This is something you and I whined about before, and I'll make this final point, that I've said that groups that engaged with MOOCs early on started to build institutional capacity, whereas those that didn't uh, are somewhat disadvantaged because they haven't built a learning design team, they haven't built a media team in a lot of cases. So fundamentally, we knew this digital learning trend was coming. It was a failure of leadership that we weren't prepared for. And that's outside of any scope of predictions.
So to actually give a practical prediction then, and it's one that I've been shouting from the rooftops is, we are gonna have a gigantic struggle in August and September onboarding students into our universities because we're gonna have, we're gonna be stuck in online situations that those people who did not prepare, um, those same people are now at home and in no position to prepare for it. So the thing that we would do to get ahead of that is to start bringing in online training situations, but start bringing in people like administrative assistants who do do the frontline work in a lot of cases of answering student questions and getting them trained to do online student support so that in the middle of August, uh, when we change our onboarding into an LMS two weeks earlier, which is the other thing we're gonna need to do, um, they're gonna be ready to actually support those students and give them the sort of small detail stuff that allows them to start their year. I know that people are not gonna be ready and that is an easy solution to do, whether or not people are gonna take that up and actually do the annoying planning and structural work that's gonna be required to get that done. Well, I, I think no, um, we've been talking about in this course as a two hump problem. One is the crisis one. The second is the plan move online. Uh, what you do right now, nothing matters. Like just treat it like we're all just trying to stay alive, right? So you're yeah. gonna do whatever you gotta do. You're on a life raft, you're floating on the ocean. You don't know how long you'll be there. You may or may not end up eating one of the people in the life raft and nobody will talk about it later when we're done. But once we're on shore, we're gonna build a better ship. And I think that's sort of where, where the second stage comes in. And I think that's what you're trying to articulate is, is what's Absolutely. going on in that stage. Which reminds me, there's an interesting conversation. So a number of, uh, of days ago, uh, there was a, a conversation that uh, Stephen Downs, who is someone that, that I think you and I have interact with it, uh, you know, had a few conversations with in the past. And so Stephen Downs made something, made a statement that said, you know, online learning should be fast, fun, crazy, unplanned, and inspirational. And uh, uh, our colleague, Matt Croslin, in this course, picked that up. Yeah, maybe, but this is a domain of practice, a domain of expertise, and the list goes on. What it ended up producing was an interesting conversation that uh, with some subtweet elements coming on later on. And Matt basically said, look, this mindset isn't quite the right one. Um, it's not accessible for those with accessibility needs and the list goes on and the conversation that rolls on as a result of it. Um, and the uh, reality is, and even Jim Groom comes along and states that uh, serious ed tech is all the rage. The plague has changed you too basically stating, which I found fascinating, a lot of the people who were in the live free, die hard, hippie ed tech movement suddenly are, you know what, I'm going to put on my tuxedo today and I'm going to talk serious learning design, serious planning, serious whatever. What's your reaction to that? Live free, die hard, and the fact that the plague in Groom's word has changed these two. Wow, that's a, that's a big one. So um, the kind of education that I normally propose sounds an awful lot more like what Stephen Downs is suggesting. Um, but I do think it, I, I actually don't buy into deep instructional design because I don't think it's replicable at a uh, practice level. Um, I don't think it deep, it gets in deep enough. I think there's way too much detail and way too much reliance on people outside of the domain of expertise to sort of instruct people on how to direct it. I'd far rather have a model that's actually easier for a faculty member to adopt with less detail and structure, but uh, what Downs is talking about is a totally different thing. That's that only only an old white man could say that. Like literally, only an old white man could say that. In these yeah, I gotta push back at that. I don't like it's a lot. Like of unless you people. already have basically a PhD and you already have a job and you've already been trained and you've already got all those things and you already feel like you're not Tell being that to a on the internet. Nah, man, I gotta call bullshit on that narrative. Um, I saw. Come on, Cormier, bring it. Um, I just saw a 17 year old kid who created a COVID mapper. Dude didn't know how to program, didn't know what the hell was going on. He's sure. bored, he's intellectually curious, he taught himself how to code. Yeah. Now, one of the first thing that came out of a lot of the MOOCs was that what MOOCs did, especially from MIT is end, they allowed them to identify and recruit brilliant kids who learn on their own. Yeah. And out of India, out of Africa, that then mm -hmm. ended up getting an appointment. Sure. So I just want to argue, it's, you know, there can be that case to it, but if you look at, for many people, regardless of race or age, and I'm sorry that you hate old people, Dave, 
regardless of age or age, you give people an access to learning opportunities and there will be brilliant people who don't need the scaffolding support that comes from a structured Absolutely learning there design. will be. So there are 5% I mean, of the population who will magically end up in the domain that they're actually structured for and will be able to go ahead and do that. I completely agree with you. Absolutely. And if you want to build an education system for those 5% of the people, you go to her. You just, I won't be coming along with you because I don't think, you know what happens with that? Do you know how we know what that builds? It builds a society that gets fooled by people who give them misinformation because we only pay attention to the top 5%. And unfortunately, given we have a democracy, that's not how voting works, George. That approach is exactly how we get here. That's what happened. Is that and we were only worrying tortured, about the autodidacts. You tortured that logic horse to death. And not you bringing other people you along. rode it into the sunset. Had we been bringing those other people along instead of dealing with your autodidacts, maybe we'd be in a different position right now. And you wouldn't be See, locked in a dark closet or wherever you are. So, you know, that's just an interesting point there because I would say it's actually the flip side. It's giving everybody democracy that got us to this situation. The the propaganda mechanisms that we're seeing right now, and I know you've read Ewan's uh, PR history of spin mm -hmm. and the idea of sort of manufactured consent and his torches of freedom argument. So the vast majority of people don't give a shit about learning, meaning they're there to live their life. Yep. They're there to say, you know what, I partied with my friends, I did this, I did that. Maybe they care about learning, but just like that ridiculously small cluster of academics that you and I are a part of who get a chance to think about things. And, you know, this was in Bonnie's video this week, the idea of power and privilege. And um, that was a part of the conversation. So that works. But the vast majority of people don't care about that. There That's are true. a few people like us in the academy who are incredibly privileged to be able to make those kinds of statements and have these kinds of conversations. But the reality is for most people, you give them an opportunity to learning, they will meet their own goals, not your goals. So yes. I think it's unfair to suggest that 5% of the people who are educated are part of the problem because everybody listens to those 5%. Oh, I wasn't calling them part of the problem. I was calling you the problem. No, no, I know that. Let's I was just, just trying to say that. the tortured horse that of logic that you rode off the ledge into the volcano I'm trying to redeem its corpse and try wow, to that metaphor, it. like that poor horse. I know that's the thing. So let's change the subject. Okay. No, bit. I want to go back. I just, I want to, I want to at least reframe this to the point where you can understand it. So do you think I'll understand um, it when I get to your age, Dave, as I get more yeah, Exactly. <laughs> so that wide openness can only work if you have the time and the prerequisites to be able to participate unless you're a magical creature who happens to, and again, that person did have the time and the prerequisites because they learned how to code on a computer that they must have had and they must have had the time when they were able to do that. So there's still time and prerequisites there. And I do think that there are things that we need to teach inside of our society that are outside of the places of absolute focus. So you yourself um, wrote a book or something on knowledge and spent I don't know, two years working your way through all the sense-making concepts that are part of that book because you really cared about it. That's not true. It came to me in a dream. Which, which you really cared about. But if I need to teach you something that is important as a society, but is not something you necessarily care about, we still need structures in place to be able to do that. Right? Dave, so there I, want are you, I want you tonight, as you go to bed and you do your evening Stuart Smalley meditation, I want you to reflect on how far you've come from your community as curriculum model, which by the way, is still one of the most delightful concepts. And uh, I hope that you Aww. continue digging that up in more detail down the road. But I just want to emphasize that as Groom called out others, you've, you've changed, man. But <laughs> on that note, I would like to change the subject if we could. I would love that. All right, so here's something that I find uh, more than just a wee bit disturbing. And I'm gonna drop in a few links just to push this out. Australia is a fascinating little place of the world. They are, and this is getting at some legit predictions yep. and not, not fluffy ones. I, you know, and so Australia right now, and I'll give you a couple stats just to back this up. There's a number of regions that have just a tremendous representation 
from international students in different sectors of the university. So University of Sydney, for example, got, uh, you know, just announced $200 million shortcoming. There's going to be universities, I will say, in Australia within the next few months that are going to declare something in the range of $500 million plus in lost revenue as a result of the international student drop. Some systems have up to 49% of their students overseas or international students. So you've got systems that are running two, three billion dollar a year operations that have fully 30% of their student population exposed. Now, it's not that bad in Canada, not that bad in the US, but wow. I mean, I don't know what else to say to that because if you've got a system where 30% plus of your total student population comes from an international group, that's going to have so those are my first two links just to set the context. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. 21,000 students in Australia, university jobs in Australia are at risk. The government said, no, nah, we're not going to help y'all because as you know, and some governments are antagonistic to the system of education. Um, and the parliament report that I just dropped in indicates that anywhere from, you know, a low of 16, 15% international student up to as high as almost 50%. And then you have a recent report um, that just came out. Oh, no, that was just a duplicate. I, my cut and paste didn't work so good. Um, and so you have another report, the Hetchinger report. I'm not sure if you follow them. They just stated that, you know, how did the last recession impact higher education? And will things be different this time? And I'm going to say we're not really in a recession so much as we are in a full on disaster. But uh, so if you click that link there, which for some reason, dear Lord, they've given us a ridiculous URL, but uh, I'll, I'll clean it up and drop it back in. What's yeah. your thinking on this, this financial so crisis? I can, I can speak more to the Canadian context. Um, there are, I, I don't, I was just looking for the exact current average. I used to know what it was like seven or eight years ago when my business was retention. Um, but right now there are any number of universities in Canada that are well over 20% international students. My own is 23. Um, so while the, the numbers are, are shocking, and when you look at the university budgets being over 70% um, salaries in almost every case, and you look at the way the union contracts are actually constructed, you can only usually get rid of a faculty member if you get rid of their entire department, right? So you need to remove the department that they're in and then move them out. And it's, it's a gigantic process to remove a tenured professor. And I'm just, just suggesting we should be firing professors. I'm just saying it's really hard to do. So what tends to happen is you lose the support systems inside of universities, right? Because it's the staff that are easy to get rid of and the faculty that are hard to get rid of. And so that has been happening in Canada for the last 10 years or so as budgets have changed. And there's another article that you posted in the Digo set that talked about what happened in the last recession, or it was the first article maybe that you put in here. Uh, but one way or the other, in our links, you had that in there. And that started the process of us cleaning out our support systems. While we were doing that, we were trying to add supports for international students at the same time because we were getting more of them because that's how we were solving our budgetary problems. So the influx of international students is the response to the recession. And now we're removing the international students, so it's doubly a problem, right? It's going to compound all of the issues that we've had and we're not going to be able to um, we're going to end up doing what brian alexander calls the queen sacrifice we're going to end up having to get rid of whole departments out of universities in order to do that what's going to happen in provinces like ontario is probably they're going to say your university is not allowed to have an arts department anymore because it's too expensive across the way we're not going to fund all this stuff anymore you're going to be the science people, you're going to be the arts people, you're going to be the whatever, and what that's going to mean, sorry for the long trail, but what all of this leads to, 10 departments instead of 10 universities, what all that's going to lead to is the unversification, what is the opposite of diversification? Um, the narrowing of the university experience. Homogenization. Homogenization of the university experience. So you're going to have students coming in and going into science, a science university, and then only learning this much science, right? Which literally breaks what a university is, from my perspective. So, yeah. you know, and I think I think you're you're, and I'll make some predictions here, or maybe not predictions. I'll, I'll set a uh, a range of three future scenarios that I can see realistically unfolding. Uh, one is the one that makes us all happy. That is, this is a blip, maybe a little bit like two thousand and eight. Uh, where, where you know, the Hedgehog Report article that you just referenced, where you have a, uh, a 
post recession because universities, as we've said before, their budgets are locked in and, and unless there's extreme crises, which this could qualify, what you're locked into is what you get. Uh, even after, as the economy goes down, the universities typically trail 12 to 18 months in terms of feeling the impact of it in a significant way. All, all bets are off for what this one's like. But let's just say things kind of normalize reasonably quickly. And by fall, we're back at everybody's on campus, happy. We're all a little bit scarred, but we're good. And we're teaching and we're doing whatever else. That is the best scenario. Unfortunately, I also think it is the least likely one. The second scenario is one where we are still roughly where we are, but maybe a little diminished. Some universities are back in, in um, September, they've got better intervention mechanisms for uh, isolating and identifying quicker testing. You know, there's some indications now of tests that can give you results in a matter of, of hours rather than you know, days worth. Right, minutes. So, so that scenario, what we would have is still a significant economic impact because we wouldn't have the international students. Some universities in Australia have taken on international students online to keep them. But in this case, semester two or year two online, they're going to say, nah, screw it, we're not doing this. And so in that case, you're going to have significant economic hurt. And then you're going to start to see a little bit of what you suggested, which is governments coming along and saying, you three universities in this city, in places like Canada and Australia that are more centrally funded, they don't have a big private university component, they'll mandate and say, you guys figure your crap out only one law department, only one of these, only one of those, and you would have basically something in the range of a very random number, but a matching reduction in funding that links to the reduction in international students. So you're talking a 20 to 30% funding drop per individual universities, and they're gonna get those savings by somewhat centralizing departments. Yes, there will be some tenured faculty loss in that environment. The third scenario, which is the most brutal, which I think is the one that's also the most likely, is that we have uh, nothing less than full on carnage. And that means you have entire universities closing, especially in the US context. That means that you have states coming in and telling universities much like what happened in Alaska last year, where they basically, the government said, we we're gonna lop like something like 40% of your budget. You have entire schools closing. You, and many of them are in the humanities and liberal arts areas because you're gonna favor the employment focused sectors, which are engineering, comp sci, uh, medicine, health, and so on. Health, for example, is going to grow rapidly. Yeah. Duh. So my prediction is, Dave, that people who go into health will do better. Anyway, so, so that's, that's what I think this scenario will look like. I really believe we are going to see nothing short of carnage in the higher education sector which is the most likely scenario of unfolding, where we are going to see fully tenured faculty lose their job across the states. It'll be different in regions like Canada and Australia that have a better centrally funded model because they can move and navigate resources around, so on. The big ones, Princeton, Stanford, Harvard, all the proverbial ones, they don't even matter. This is irrelevant to them. They've got $40 billion dollars no sitting in an endowment, so it doesn't matter. No um, so just what do you think oh, of those three scenarios? Which ones would you call most likely? Oh, I agree with you. I, I, I was nodding the whole time. It, it pained me the entire time I was doing it, but I agree with thought you. I thought it was a kink in your neck, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, it's just, we already did this. We already cleaned out all the budgets. We already, we already went through this process. We already took the fat out of those budgets. I, I remember when I got into higher ed, um, the amount of money you could get th for things is totally different than it is now you could stand up a project in no time. If you had an argument or a pitch or whatever else, there was always money that could be slung around to getting that done. And it's a very different landscape now, right? It really has changed, except for those few schools, which recently have had the international student boon. Um, and those have been able to go back to some of those halcyon days of being able to have money uh, and that's gone again. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be, there's going to be wreckage. Um, I think educational technology and online learning might be another one of those growth uh, areas. Um, I, I think I just want to pick up on that. You know, we've got about four minutes left here, but I, I, because, and I think you're bang on, we've already cut what's cuttable. Yeah. Universities post 2008 um, had to eliminate many support positions, the, uh, the reduction of tenured faculty, 
continued, which was part of a longer term trend, the rise of adjuncts. You look at places like Australia, for example, that run on contract employment, yep. you, you know, even a up to 60, 70% in some cases. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So that's the environment that you have, which means that now if you're going to cut, you're amputating, you're no longer removing flesh to put, like, you're literally saying, yeah, this arm's got to go. Yep. And there was an interesting report with you know, Australia, which has you know, its own unique government structure. And I'm just going to drop this in sort of as a final link, which said that the Australian government with their current thing is like, hey, if you're international, maybe you should just go home, which is usually not a great thing to say to your international students, but hey. Um, and they basically said this is going to kill international education for at least a decade, but I'll say it will irreparably alter the education landscape and the move towards learning for a job versus learning for so-called self-actualization which is why I find the pushback against down so odd because so many people in the academy, especially liberal arts, emphasize this, you learn, you control your fate, your destiny. And all of a sudden, like we're in this weird flipped world where the hippies are saying, nah, man, we need structure and we need routine. What's happening, Dave? What is happening? I mean, I'm obviously in the middle of that conversation. Like I think that the instructional design people are way over. Conversation, Dave. You can't have conflict if you're going to be- I'm, hold, I'm holding the balance. The one thing I will say to, to contradict what you said is that those people who are leaving uh, countries to go to other countries, that's about status eternally. That's not about learning. So that's not going to change, right? It's not the, there's not going to be a cultural shift, I don't think. At least, in, I can only speak, the, the only country I spent any time in is South Korea. I spent five or six years teaching there. Um, it is a, a piece of cultural status, the same way in Australia that leaving on a, on a, on a tour. It's just, it's part of the process of uh, what a certain class does whenever they reach a certain age. I don't think that that's going to go away after this process. I think the international students are going to go back out again. I don't think they're going to stay home. But the governments won't have a budget. Like we're talking a U.S. forecast 30% decline in this quarter, right? We're yep. talking, we're, we're seeing numbers that make the Great Depression look like it was a period of economic Like progress. it wasn't very great at all. Yeah, it was like, it's now the second best depression. You get to be a goodish depression. Anyway. Um, on that happy note. On that happy note. Cormier, always good to chat. Cheers, buddy. Everybody, you. thank you for your patience. Have a great day. All right, Wash take your care. hands. Don't touch your face.